The first problem is a great integrative problem that reviews topics we've talked about all semester. Each of these three columns are different ways of describing a system. The left column, the pole zero plot column, is a way of describing the system transfer function, h of s. h of s is a polynomial in s. It might look like this, for instance. The roots of the numerator are called zeros. In other words, what we're doing is solving the numerator for zero. So here the, there is a zero at zero. And the roots of the denominator are called poles. That would be the solution of the denominator equals zero. In this particular example, the poles will be complex conjugate pairs. You can find these roots either using the quadratic formula or by factoring. In this particular example, the poles are complex conjugates. In a pole zero plot, we're going to plot the poles and the zeros on the complex conjugate plane. A Bode plot is another way of describing the system transfer function. Here, we evaluate our system transfer function substituting j omega, that's an omega, substituting a j omega in for s. So for this example, we would have j omega over j omega squared. And you know that j squared is negative 1, so you could make that substitution if you wanted, plus 1. So this is our frequency response, which is the transfer function with j omega substituted for s. And if you evaluate the magnitude of this, you get your magnitude Bode response. Alternatively, you could evaluate the angle and find the angle of your Bode response. This Bode plot shows the magnitude of h of omega. You can show this as either h of omega or h of j omega. It's the same plot. And so this is what's being plotted. In the last column, we're taking a look at the impulse response to the system. That is the third unique way of describing what a system is. And in particular, it's describing the response of the system to an input of an impulse. So therefore, you're looking at the impulse response. This is in the time domain, as opposed to the Bode response, which is in the frequency domain. This funny looking arrow in the beginning is a Dirac delta function. That's another word for an impulse. Let's take a look at how to solve this problem. So use the hint, try recreating h of s given the pole zero plot. So for problem one, it looks like we've got a single real pole. See if there's any others that look like that. Number two looks like that too. The pole is just further out. Everything else looks different. So one and two will both be of the form h of s. We've got no zeros in any of these, so therefore the numerator will be one. And the denominator here might look something like, it's not labeled with numbers, but let's call it s plus one. And that'll help us differentiate it from number two or our s looks much bigger and negative. So that might be something like, I don't know, s plus 10. Now, if we have something that looks like 1 over s plus 1, then that would mean our h of j, where we sub or j omega, same thing, where we substitute j omega for our s, looks like 1 over j omega plus 1. So what is its Bode response? Two ways to find it out. You could take your calculator and substitute in a number of these different omegas to plot it. But a much faster way is to use your Bode response uh, paper and to say, how many zeros are there? There are no zeros. How many poles are there? There's a pole at uh, negative 1. And so if we want to plot what that looks like, we're going to start. We're going to start that plot out. Where vertically do we start it out? 
is it horizontal? There's no zeros at zero and there's no poles at zero, so it starts out horizontal. If there was a zero at zero, if there was an S in the numerator, it would start by going up at 20 dB per decade. And if there was a zero in the denominator, if it looks something like that, this is a zero in the denominator, and then it would start by going down by 20 dB per decade. But since there are no zeros or poles at zeros, it's going to start flat someplace. What is that flat point? I don't know. Let's just substitute in for omega equals zero and find out. When omega equals zero, this whole thing becomes one over one, which is one. One, as a log in decibels, is zero dB. Remember that. Remember that your value in decibels is equal to 20 log base 10 of whatever number k you're interested in. So for this particular example, we're going to start off at 0 dB. And it's flat until it hits your first 0 or pole. So although your poles will all be negative, and your zeros can be negative or positive, we take the magnitude of these poles and zeros. And here it occurs at 1. And when it hit every pole, it starts to go down by negative 20 dB per decade, more than it was before. Now let's compare that with the second one, because that looks awfully familiar. Here we've got the same type of thing. But now we've got j omega plus 10. So here we've still got no poles. We've still got, or rather, no zeros. Now we've got a pole at minus 10. So for this one, now it starts out not at 0 dB. If we put in 0 in here, we start out at 1 tenth. And 1 tenth in this equation says it starts out at minus 10 dB. The location of this horizontal axis is just arbitrary. And now it goes down at 10 radians per second and it's still going down at that same minus 20 dB per decade. Now we're in a position to see which of these things we're looking at. Well, B and C both correspond to things that look like this. We don't have the vertical axis labeled on each, but it's pretty clear that this is to the right of this. So therefore, this must correspond to 2. And this must correspond to 1. What's going on with 3? Three? 3, we've definitely, here, we've now got a 0. We've got something that has this 0. Maybe it's, again, it's kind of arbitrary and hard to tell. Let's say it's s plus 10 over s plus 1. So we've got our 0 at minus 10. And we've got our pole at minus 1. So now, if we were to draw that graph, we still need to find out what a zero frequency behavior is. To do that, we substitute in 0 for our frequency. We get 10. Using this equation, we see that corresponds to 20 dB. So it starts off at 20 dB. And it stays there until it reaches 1, since this is the first Thing, it runs into its a pole. And at 1, it starts to go down by minus 20 dB per decade. And it continues to go down until it reaches 10. That's the next zero or pole. And that occurs after, after one decade. And since it drops by 20 dB per decade, this must be 0 dB. And now the 0 means it will go up by 20 dB per decade. But since it was already going down by 20 dB per decade when it hit that zero, now its new value will be 0 dB. So we'll have a, a Bode's plot that looks something like this. That corresponds to E. So this corresponds to E. This corresponds to B. And this corresponds to C, rather than having a bunch of crossing lines. How about this one, number 4? Here are h of s. The only way to describe that, there's no zeros, and it's got a pole at zero. So there's no zeros, 
and there's a pole at s equals zero. Now, if you try to draw the Bode response of that, you can't plug in zero frequency. It grows to infinity. So you've got to start it from some non-zero point. And of course, you can never get to zero frequency on a logarithmically spaced plot. This isn't zero on this plot. This is 0 0.1. And before that would be 0 0.01 and 0 0.001. You never get to zero. So when we plot these, we have to start off plotting someplace. And wherever we start plotting off, the question is, does it start off flat, going up, or going down? And since it's got a pole, and that pole has already occurred, it's going to start off going down and it's going to continue to go down forever because it doesn't meet any more poles or zeros. It's going to go down at minus 20 dB per decade. Now, if you wanted to draw the entire Bode response, the problem would have to say, where do you want to start drawing it from? So maybe it would say, start drawing at omega equals uh, 0 0.1. And then you'd evaluate this equation, substituting in S for J omega, You'd substitute in then omega equals 0 0.1. You'd find its magnitude, and then that would be its, you'd convert that magnitude to decibels, and then that would be this value here. So this question doesn't ask for it, but just for completeness sake, if you wanted to find out what this full plot was, you'd evaluate h of j omega at 0 0.1, which is 1 over j 0 0.1 and we're graphing up here we're graphing the magnitudes but that's just the same as magnitude of 1 which is 1 of the magnitude of j times 0 0.1 and that's 0 0.1 so that's 10 so that's 20 db plugged in this formula and so you'd end up having a fully notated equation body response that looks like that. But this looks like this up here. So therefore, this is A. And 5. Now, 5 is tricky. 5 shows these complex conjugate pairs of poles. You can't draw Bode responses by hand for things with complex conjugates. Complex conjugate sets of poles means that there's residence. And that resonance occurs at a frequency corresponding to the height of these poles above the plane. So, well, just by elimination, it has to be D. But also, this resonant peak here occurs at a frequency here. That omega uh, critical frequency is the same as that J omega naught. So just for completeness sake, can't do can't do hand Bode responses um, for complex conjugate poles or zeros. Not difficult to do by computer. You do it the exact same way. This one has complex conjugate poles. You plug in J omega for S, and then you just evaluate this for a bunch of different omegas, and then you'd end up with something that looked like this. Let's do this last section on H of T's. A mistake that some students make is not to realize that the time domain response is not the same as the frequency domain response. What each of these points here means is what the magnitude is change of an input sinusoidal steady state signal. If down here was some very small number, maybe negative 50 dB, what it's saying is that that vertical frequency here, if that corresponded to minus 50 dB, it would cut your signal, it would cut an input sinusoid of this frequency down by minus 50 dB, which is pretty close to zero. That's completely different than the time domain response, which says if we put in an impulse, what does the output do in the time domain? To find that, we take a look at the system transfer function. We take its inverse transform. So just by inspection, this looks something like e to the minus t, u of t, this might look like something like e to the minus 10t, u of t. This one is not a uh, proper fraction, so we'd have to do long division first. And we got when we did the long division, we'd end up with something that looked like 1 plus something over 
s plus 1. I mean, we could do the long division to find out that this would be the remainder. But this tells us that the inverse of this, 1 transforms to an impulse, and this transforms to whatever this thing, whatever the numerator is, times e to the minus t u of t. This one has an inverse of u of t. You could derive an h of s mathematically from the locations of these poles. You could assume that they occur at, say, plus and minus j omega, and then do and then multiply through to find your system transfer function. But a much faster way is to remember that when you've got complex poles, you end up with a sinusoid output. So therefore, by inspection, this has to correspond with v. Number 1 and 2 are similar. But one is e to the minus t, one is e to the minus 10t. So the second one is going to decay a lot faster. So these both are exponentially decaying, but this decays a lot faster. So this corresponds with 2. 3, therefore, has to correspond with 1. That leaves our impulse plus a decaying exponential. Well, that's up here. So that corresponds to this guy. And then our u of t, 2, corresponds to our pole at 0. And that's problem 1.